to introduce our speaker for tonight. So we are lucky to have Ted Stiles from New Hampshire Saves presenting to us tonight. He was a high school educator for 20 years before becoming a certified energy auditor in 2010. He works for one of the approved contractors in the New Hampshire Saves program as an auditor and still teaches part-time through the Lakes Region Community College and the Button Up New Hampshire program. He lives in Stratum, New Hampshire with his wife and children, and he will be available for questions throughout the presentation, as well as at the end of the chat, whether you wanna put those in the chat or raise your virtual hand or unmute yourselves, um, that is up to you. Ted, I will pass it over to you. All right, great. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Appreciate that very much. Um, as she said, um, yeah, my day job sort of is, uh, do, is an, as an energy auditor and uh, I also, are, I'm still involved in education, um, in particular by doing these button up presentations. We've been doing a lot of these the last few years through Zoom. We're getting back to doing some in person too. Um, it's a really sort of uh, in-depth uh, presentation. It's got some real basic stuff that might bore you. It's got some real advanced stuff that might challenge you. Um, hopefully we'll you know do something in the middle. Um, a lot of information and I'm really passionate about this stuff. I talk really fast, so I, I apologize for that ahead of time. Um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Like she said, you could also unmute yourself and ask. Um, but I will say, you know, chances are we're going to probably cover it is cover whatever it is you're going to ask. Um, so you might want to uh, reconsider that if you if you uh, unless it's something you really, really need, you know, think that uh, you want to ask. That's fine. Um, this is uh, this event here is, um, or this presentation is put on sponsored by the different utilities here. Uh, that you see labeled there. Those are the four, uh, you know, electric and natural gas uh, utilities here in New Hampshire. And we're going to be talking about energy efficiency in your home. This is a quick overview of uh, sort of the things we're going to go over tonight. We're going to go through some real basic stuff in the beginning, um, and then we'll get into the real kind of the meat and potatoes of it. I think the stuff I love, talk about the ABCs, you'll know what those are in reference to home efficiency. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, when your head's kind of exploding, we'll talk about, well, what can you actually do uh, with this? And we'll talk about the New Hampshire SAGE programs. And then uh, we've also added a little slide in here with a little bit of information about the IRA uh, rebates that are, are new this year. So usually when I'm doing this in person, I would ask the room, you know, well, what do you think is the greenest energy? Um, and as you can tell, um, you can probably guess what some of the answers are when I ask that question. You know, usually there's someone right off the bat, oh, solar, solar is the greenest energy out there. And other people say, oh, no, you got to mine all the minerals. And what do you do with the solar panels when you're done? And they say hydro, hydro is completely clean. That's the greenest thing you can do. Uh, well, what about the dams? You have to, you know, there's something to be said. There's a negative side of that. Other people say, well, what about wind turbines? Wind turbines are great. And then someone brings up, a negative side to wind turbines, right? And, and the answer really to this question, I think, is the energy that you're not using at all, right? Now, don't get me wrong, I love solar and I think wind is great, but those are all energy production methods and there's a downside to those. There's an environmental cost to all of those. There really is no argument that you can make against using less energy or not using energy. So that's kind of why I got into this field about 25 or so years ago when I was an educator and I was looking for something different. Um, I saw a bumper sticker actually that said, you know, the greenest energy is the energy you're not using. That really kind of struck a chord with me. And that's why I got into doing energy audits and helping people, you know, reduce their energy, um, energy use. Um, one little graph here we'll start off with, you know, uh, if, if you haven't been in New Hampshire long, um, you might not notice, but you'll know it pretty soon. If you've been here a long time, you know it. We spent a lot of money on energy here in New Hampshire. Um, part of that is because we have a six month heating season which is a shock to people who move here from, say, South Carolina or Florida. Um, the, you know, the Chamber of Commerce doesn't tell you that when you call up and say, I'm thinking about moving to New Hampshire. They send you all the cool brochures about, you know, we have no sales tax and this and that. We have all these great ski resorts. They tell you all this great stuff. They don't tell you is um, you're going to be heating your house with six, for six months. And they're not going to tell you that electricity is really expensive. And they're not going to tell you that natural gas is not everywhere. Um, and that you're probably going to be heating your home with propane or oil, which is, again, a shock to people if you're from other parts of the country where that's just not the norm. Um, so, you know, we spent a lot of money on, on, our, on our homes. And you can see here from the graph where most of that money goes. Most of that money goes actually to keeping your house, you know, heated and cool. Um, so, you know, the other thing I get from this graph is, you know, like I'm happy that there's engineers out there coming up with better refrigeration systems and better refrigerators. Um, 
I'm not an engineer, so I couldn't get in that line of work. Uh, and I also wouldn't want to either because that's just a small little slice of this pie here. So um, that's why I'm happy to be working in the you know energy auditing field and reducing uh, people's uh, home energy use because that is the biggest piece of the pie here. It's funny, there's a, a headline here that I just realized is outdated. It says, higher electricity rates are looming for many New Hampshire customers. This was put in here back in July, I guess it was. And uh, right after that was when most of the major uh, electric suppliers here in New Hampshire doubled their rates. So uh, you're probably experiencing that right now and not very happy about it. So we'll start off with some electric stuff because everyone has an electric bill unless you're, you know, happen to be off grid or something like that. Um, the first thing I would say you could do is just, you know, don't just grumble and pay your bill each month. Look at it a little bit more in depth. There's a little more information in there that might be helpful to you. It'll give you a graph of how you're doing from month to month. It'll tell you, you know, how you're doing compared to other people in your neighborhood or in houses of your size. Um, so that's one thing you can start to kind of um, get a hold on that might help you. In terms of the things that are in your house that are using the most energy, uh, electricity at least, that you have some control over, you know, the top three here would be uh, lighting, your water heater, if that's electric, uh, and your refrigerator or your freezer. All the other things in your house, like your dryer, entertainment center, things like that, they're all using power, but um, there's not as much stuff you can do for those things. Um, the, the real big items, again, would be the refrigerator, the water heater, and um, lighting is actually, it's a little bit of a misleading chart here because lighting, it really isn't um, the biggest one, but it's usually the one of the ones you can most cost effectively take care of you know, real quick right off the bat. So that's why it's sort of up there at the top of this chart. Obviously, this, this chart is going to vary hugely based on, you know, if you have kids in your family, what your habits are, um, the size of your home and things like that. If you're interested in finding out like how much one individual device in your house uses, you can get one of these things called a kilowatt meter. You can actually check it out from your library. Uh, each library should have one of these still. Um, and it basically, you can plug anything in it and you, you have to do a little math, but you can figure out, you know, how much this particular appliance is costing you a year. They also have these new uh, whole house electric uh, monitors, which are really neat. This screenshot here from someone's phone is actually from one that's called the Sense Meter. That's the one I'm most familiar with. There are a couple other brands out there. Um, they're a couple hundred dollars, but they're really neat because they actually go and they measure your whole entire house individually and in total. So it's really cool. Like I, I went to a workshop and a guy had one. He's like, he, he pulled it out, looked at it. He's like, oh, look, my kid just finished, you know, taking a shower because the electric water heater just came on. And then, oh, they just left the garage door just opened up. Uh, oh, and they left the light on in the hallway. I mean, he could see every little thing. Um, you have to get, you have to be careful with these things though. I had one once and uh, I put it in my house and then I came home that night and uh, my kids were younger then they, they came home from school, put their backpacks down. They went in and looked at this little thing on the counter and then they turned to their mother like, what have you been doing all day, mom? You used 25 kilowatts of electricity already. And she was like, I'm going to rip that thing out of the wall. Like, yeah, I had to run the electric, the, the, the vacuum cleaner. I had the TV on for a while. I had some lights on because I have to be able to see, you know, so you can get a little crazy with these things. But if you have some weird electric things going on in your house, in other words, you've already done a lot and you still feel like your electric bill is too high. Um, this can be helpful because it can tell you something about like maybe your well pump is cycling too often or there's an issue with your uh, something else that's hardwired into your house. So these can be really helpful too. This seems kind of uh, ridiculous to put in here, but you know, shutting things off when you're not using them. Um, sometimes I'm in people's houses and you know they're paying me a couple hundred dollars to help them reduce their energy use. And they're out in the backyard, you know, gardening or, or cutting the grass and I'm inside and there's TVs on in one room and there's a stereo in the other room and there's lights on all over the house. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of us have gotten into some really bad habits, uh, especially when when electricity was cheap of just leaving things on all the time. And um, so, so with some behavioral change, there's some stuff that you can do there, too. Uh, believe it or not, there are some things in your home that are always using power, even when you hit the off button. So you think that they're actually off. And we call these vampire loads or phantom loads or drips, energy drips, they can call them. Um, this would be, um, these are becoming, you know, increasingly popular too. Like when I was a kid, I don't think there was anything that was a vampire load. And now a lot of houses have many of these. Um, this would be anything that's got like a built-in charger, anything with a clock or remote control, like a TV. That always ha is on and using a little bit of power. Uh, anything with lights on, um, DVRs, entertainment centers, things like that. 
these are a couple examples that I, you know, I found. I pulled off the internet. Uh, I think the Apple TV there is the second one. That's kind of an interesting one. So that when they first came out with that, it was using 21 watts of power when you were actually using it. And when you hit the off button and, and left for the day or went in the other room, you thought it was off, but it was still using 17 watts of electricity, which is almost as much as it was using when you were actually using it. So some of these things are just really crazy. Um, the way to control this is to get one of these power strips, a smart power strip. Um, you can get them from New Hampshire Saves. You can get them from other places too, but you can plug all your things into there. Like, especially, you know, a lot of people are working home right now. So you could have your computer and your monitor, your speakers, your printer, all these different things into there. You don't have to have them on all the time. Uh, you can sort of use them uh, whenever you need to. Um, this is an interesting uh, slide and photograph here that we have to switch change this year when we uh, when we revamp the program. But anyone can anyone figure out why this top picture here with the guy turning it down his water heater is not going to save any electricity? It's kind of a mistake in the picture. Anyone can anyone want to chime in and figure can figure out why that's not going to save any electricity? He's turning it from hot to warm. So it's definitely going to save energy. I'll give you a hint. It's going to save energy, but it's not going to save electricity. Well, what's that? I thought I heard someone it's chime in there. Um, yeah, it's a gas water heater. So it's going to save it's going to save gas, but not electricity. Um, again, it's going to save energy no matter what. But you know, most people have electric water heaters, and if you turn that down to 120, most people have it set way too high. You know, dangerously high where it'll, it can scald you. Um, Dehumidifiers, you know, we don't want to tell you not to use them. If you need to use them to keep your, you know, your basement um, dry, use it, but, you know, keep it at a uh, reasonable level. Uh, I learned really on that, you know, all my clothes I wash in cold water, unless I have something that's really, really um, dirty and stained, you really don't need hot wa water for most clothes. And of course, you know, here in New Hampshire, at least you can still wash, you, you can still dry your clothes outside on a, a clothesline. Um, I've heard that there are some, um, condo associations and maybe some other um, communities around the country that are starting to like, you know, outlaw clotheslines because I guess they think they're unsightly or something, but I haven't heard of that happening here in New Hampshire. So you can feel free to take care of that, you know, or to take advantage of that solar energy out there. Can't say enough good things about LED lights. When I first started doing this, we were screwing in the little CFL bulbs that had mercury and they flickered and they never worked right. They took forever to warm up. You know, the LED industry has really figured out all those problems. They've gotten rid of all those problems. Um, they're producing light bulbs now that look just like an old light bulb that you might have grown up with uh, that only uses eight or nine watts of, of power, but it's replacing a 75 or 100 watt power uh, 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 light bulb. Uh, they have different, so many different types now. You can get them for chandeliers and recessed lights and, and lamps and three-way three -way switches, just about anything you can imagine you can get with an LED. And they've really come down in price too. Um, they were really expensive for a while, but now they're really cheap. No excuse not to do this. Um, the one thing I would caution you is uh, to take a look at what they call the Kelvin number on the light or the, uh, the rating of the, uh, or the description of the color. Usually what you're looking for is something like warm white or soft white. That would be the, uh, the sort of yellowish picture at the bottom there. Um, the one that says daylight, it sounds really appealing. Oh, I love daylight. Who, who doesn't like to love daylight, right? But the daylight bulbs are actually the one on the left there. They're a little bit more of a bluish tint. And most people find that those are really, really uh, uncomfortable in, inside the house. Um, that's actually like more like a 5,000 Kelvin light bulb. So take a look at the number and go for something like 2,700 or 3,000 or just look for warm white or soft white. Uh, also make sure that it works for dimmers. If you're gonna, if you have dimmers in your house, um, you wanna make sure you're getting the right one. By the way, we're recording this and the uh, we can give you PDFs of the presentation if there's something you missed. So, cause I am going to go fast through some of this stuff for sure. Other real easy things you can do, you know, low flow shower heads. Every time you take a shower, you're gonna save energy. Um, a lot of people are afraid to put these in cause they think it's gonna be like a little dribble of water on them. It really isn't. In fact, a lot of people report that uh, it feels like there's more water coming out with a low flow shower head just because it's coming out at a higher pressure. Um, our uh, duct wrap or duct insulation, I'm sorry, um, pipe insulation like this is really inexpensive at, at any hardware store, really easy to put in. And that'll save you money if you have pipes like down in your basement, places like that. Um, 
We're not going to recommend that you go out and replace all of your appliances with Energy Star. Um, that would be a lot of money and it would be kind of really bad for the planet. Um, so if you have something, you know, use it, get your useful, useful life out of it. But when you are looking to replace it, that's when it's time to look for that, you know, Energy Star label. The other reason to look for Energy Star is because there are some really good rebates out there now uh, for all sorts of different um, appliances. You can even get them for like room purifiers and things. If you have a pool, you can get it for a pool pump, things like that. Um, you can go to the New Hampshire Saves um, website and you get some more information about those. All right, good. So we're done with electricity, unless you actually are heating your home with electricity, which is um, a really expensive prospect these days. Uh, I just did an audit yesterday for a person that has all electricity in their house and they are absolutely going broke trying to keep their house warm. So hopefully this isn't a picture of you like in your house, although I have done energy audits where people are wearing gloves and hats in the house because it's so cold. And they either can't afford to keep it warm enough or they just literally can't get it warm enough. Um, hopefully this is you walking around outside. Um, like I mentioned, you know, we the fact is we have to heat our homes. We heat our homes for a long, long period here in New Hampshire. Um, but when I go to do an energy audit, you know, I could just tell people, well, just turn your thermostat down and dress like this guy. You'll save a lot of money. You know, but nobody wants to dress like that in their house. <laughs> You know, they, it's, so it's okay to wear earmuffs going to the store, but you don't want to wear them in your house. So we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to, um, you know, save money on our energy bills, but we also still want to be comfortable in our own homes. So that's kind of, you know, where, where the, the challenge comes in. A couple of really, uh, you know, low tech sort of easy things you can do. First one would be to make sure you're turning the heat down when you're not in your room or you're not in your house. A lot of people will argue about this and say that, um, you know, well, doesn't it, if, if I turn the heat down while I go to work all day, when I come home, it's got to crank really high, hard and, and long to get the heat, to get the house back up to my the temperature that I want it, right? Yes, it does have to work a long time to get it back, or a little bit longer to get it back up to that temperature, but the savings from leaving it at a lower temperature all day long or at, while you're sleeping actually will outweigh the energy use that it took to bring it back up to that temperature. So it does make sense. Um, it doesn't make sense if you're only going out for, you know, half hour or an hour. Um, it's got to be, you know, extended period of time, but it's definitely got something that can save you money. If you're the kind of person that keeps forgetting to turn off the heat or turn it down uh, when you go to work or you go to sleep, programmable thermostat. Um, I'm not a really big believer in the real high tech expensive ones. Um, a real basic one from, you know, that costs $30 will do almost the same thing. Uh, it'll take care of things if you forget. Uh, you know, air conditioners are supposed to be coming out in the winter, not staying in there all uh, all winter long. And storm windows are supposed to be closed in the winter, not left open the way they are in the summer. And uh, the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that windows don't really work very well in terms of keeping the cold air out if they if they won't latch and if they're not closed correctly. They're actually designed to work the most efficiently when they're actually locked shut. So go around and make sure that all that stuff's taken care of. Those are really easy, low hanging fruit. We'll do a quick review of sort of some high school physics, uh, you know, energy principles, because I think that's important to make sure you have a handle on this before we get into some of the concepts with building science and how it works in houses. You probably remember this, you know, hot always goes from hot to cold. That's just one of the first rules of physics. Um, so your home is always losing heat to the outdoors, through the walls, through the ceiling, through the floor. Uh, if it's colder outside than it is inside, the heat's always going through there. We can't really stop it. Uh, all we can do is slow it down, right? Uh, either a little, a medium amount, or a lot. Um, heat moves in three different ways. We got conduction, convection, radiation. There's actually more than that, but we're not going to get into the other ones. Um, and we're not even going to get into radiation really either, because that's not really a factor here in New Hampshire. In Hampshire, uh, the first two are the ones that we're most concerned about, conduction and convection. So conduction, as I mentioned a minute ago, is sort of losing heat going through a cold area through a solid surface. So this person here is holding like a metal rod or something in a candle. Well, eventually they're going to wish they had a glove on because that heat's going to go right through the metal rod and then get to their hand. Um, and that will work, you know, that works sort of throughout all the different parts of your house too. So how do you conduct that? Well, this person would put a glove on. A glove is an insulating thing. It will actually protect it. It's a, it's a poor thermal conductor. It does not allow the heat to go through very quick. Um, so that's a good thing. So we want insulation in our houses, just like this person you know, wants a good, good glove on their hand. 
A lot of things can be insulating, right? Everything is actually insulating to a point. Um, here's a couple examples of some things that I've seen in houses in the last few years that um, are insulating. They're not necessarily the best insulating thing. Um, anyone take a guess at what that insulation material is on the top left? It's that stringy looking stuff. Chances are you don't have that in your house. It'd be really rare, but it could be. I've only seen three or four houses in 12 years that had this, but that's actually seaweed. Uh, and that was a house way out in Walpole, New Hampshire, which is way far away from the ocean. But there actually was a company uh, back in the day called the Cabot Company. I mean, now, I guess it was named after the seafaring uh, navigator uh, Cabot. Um, and they actually used to dry out seaweed and bag it up and send it around. And it got installed in people's homes as insulation. Um, bottom left is balsam wool. That was uh, a big product back in the 50s, you know, an inch or two of that. That was considered an insulated house. I mean, that would be laughable today, but back then that was insulated. Um, those are pantyhose and underwear on the top right. I mean, this person must have been really desperate because they were taking their underwear and stuffing it into the holes in their walls, literally. So uh, yeah, people are doing some pretty desperate things to try to you know keep their houses warm. I took this picture recently in the top left. And I showed the homeowner because they and they couldn't believe me. I'm like, they've never been up in their attic before. I was like, yeah, somebody decided before you before you bought the house, someone decided that all the old chaise lounge cushions and all their old down comforters and stuff would be good insulation. So they dragged it up through the attic hatch and like threw it over there in the corner. Uh, it probably does have a fair amount of our value to it in terms of insulating, but not the best thing to have in your attic. I'm sure the mice loved it, you know. Here's some, a lot of corn cobs that are either left over from a, a farmer who dumped them up there or possibly some rats that brought it up there. Kind of hard to tell. But a lot of houses in New Hampshire will have some, some pretty strange things in them. I mentioned the term R value. R value is just a number that we use to rate uh, something's ability to slow down heat loss. So the higher the number, the better it is at slowing down uh, heat loss. Um, it doesn't automatically mean that the higher the number is the best. Um, this is per inch, right? So fiberglass is about three and a half. Uh, cellulose is about the same thing. You get, start getting into some rigid foam boards and some spray foams, so you can get up to six or seven. Um, you know, a concrete wall or a brick wall, it doesn't really matter if it's four, six, eight, ten 10 inches thick. It's really only about R1. Um, so everything is sort of, you know, varies there. Uh, so in certain situations, you might want to use something different than others. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, again, it's not all about the numbers, though. You could have something that has a really good R value per inch, but if it's installed poorly, which oftentimes it is, because in New Hampshire, like you, you need a license to cut hair in New Hampshire, but you do not need a license to put in insulation. Uh, so there's a lot of places that get done really, really poorly. Um, so a lot of it's about the install. All right, so a new house in New Hampshire. Uh, is supposed to be uh, following certain um, R values for the different assemblies. And there they are at the top. And the average house in New Hampshire is usually nowhere near any of those numbers, whether it's the attic or the walls or the basement walls. Uh, you know, I'm in houses that are sometimes, you know, R0 or R1 maybe at the most in the attic or in the walls or in the basement. Um, again, not every, uh, some people are shocked when they move here and they find out that their house is not anywhere close to any of these numbers. And you don't even need to be a licensed contractor to build a house in New Hampshire. And some towns don't have building inspectors and some that do aren't really enforcing the building code. But technically speaking, if you look, by, look at the book, we're supposed to be following 2015 building code right now. A couple of different ways that insulation can be uh, installed poorly. It can be insufficient, which is just not enough. It can be incomplete, which means it's uh, not everywhere where it's supposed to be. And it can actually be really good, but it can just be misaligned. In other words, it could be a really good material, but it could be in the wrong place. And some of these pictures show these examples here. On the left, you can see, I mean, there's bare sheetrock there. So that's obviously insufficient. There's not enough. Um, incomplete, the middle picture, you can see there's a, a couple inches that is completely open there. You can look down into the, uh, the floor joist cavities. Um, those are two by sixes. So you can see a couple inches of wood there. So there's really not much going on there. And this top right picture is, a, is where someone used actually some foil faced um, polyiso board, which is actually a really expensive product, really good per inch R value. But what they did is they did their end walls and their slopes and their attic, and then they left the gable vent open. That, that's daylight coming in there. So it's kind of like having a window open. 
so it's just a classic case of like, you know, using something, um, not having a really good idea about what you're doing, using something with some really good R value, but then um, putting it in the wrong place or not aligning it up in the best way. This was a house I was in Nashua a couple of years ago, and uh, they had massive ice dams in one part of their house back in the back where you can't see there through that door. Uh, and I was looking at it, I was kind of admiring the really cool modern lights and everything. And then I went into the, uh, the, the attic, which is back there behind it where you can't see. And I'm gonna just jump forward and I'll jump back again. But I want you to notice that there's a heat register in the middle of that wall there. And then there's a row of windows above it, right? We've got five windows and then we have that that register coming out of the wall, which should have a duct going to it. So when I went into the attic, this is what it looked like from the backside now. So you you can actually see this silver duct going through the wall here, and it's got insulation next to it. But what do you see above that? No insulation, just wood. So there's a whole layer, the whole horizontal layer between those windows and that duct. It's about 30 or 40 feet long and two or three feet high with absolutely no insulation in it whatsoever. And this is a really new house, a really nice house too, with a massive ice dam problem, just because somebody didn't really think about uh, or fully kind of investigate, well, where are we supposed to be putting the insulation? You know, they threw it up in the obvious spots, but they didn't realize there's this other spot up there that needs to be done. And believe it or not, that's pretty common. All right, I'm not gonna embarrass anybody by asking them, but to yourself, you can answer this question and see if you're right or not. True or false, does heat rise? Um, if you said true, I'm sorry to say you're wrong because heat does not rise. I'm sure you've heard that before. It's a little bit of a trick question, I, I'll admit that, but heat does not rise. Heat goes to cold. We just talked about that. We just said heat goes to wherever it's cold. That's the basic principle of physics. It doesn't matter if the cold thing is up, down, left, right, diagonal, north, south, it'll go there. That's the direction that heat energy goes into. Um, but there is this phenomenon called con convection, whereas uh, something that's liquid or like a liquid, like air, if it's warmer than other parts of air or liquid, it'll actually rise and move. And it looks like heat's rising, but it's really not the heat that's rising. It's the air that's rising that happens to be warm, if that makes sense to you. A little bit of a trick question, like I said, but it's, a, it's an important distinction to make because when you're seeing that, you're not actually seeing heat rising you're seeing hot air rising. And that's the way, you know, hot air balloons work, right? If, if heat didn't, if, if hot air didn't rise or warm air didn't rise, a hot air balloon would never work. And you can think of your house a little bit, you know, sort of in the, in the same way. So next time you hear someone say heat rises, if you're feeling like starting to fight, you can say, no, it doesn't. Heat goes to cold. Hot air is the thing that's rising. So how this comes into play in a house is, um, you know, you, the, the, you have some cold air that comes in the bottom of the house, you pay to heat it up, it becomes expensive air, and then it goes to the top of the house. And we all like it to stick around and stay because we paid to heat it up. But fact is, it doesn't really do that. It finds all the places it can leak, and it leaks out, and it goes out. Now, every time it leaks out, it's got to get replaced, right? Because if you lost all your air, you wouldn't be able to breathe in your house. So there's always a constant supply of cold air coming in at the bottom. That's why those airs are blue down there. And then there's warm air going out at the top. You can actually see this for yourself, like inside a room too, especially if you have a wood stove, like in this little diagram here, right? Like the wood stove is going to heat up the air around it and that hot air is going to rise because hot air rises. It's going to get over near the window. The windows are cold, so it's going to get colder and it's going to be dense and it's going to sink and it's going to come across the floor where it hits the, the, the wood stove and it's going to get hot and rise again. So you can have these convective loops, you know, inside a room too. You can actually have them inside your walls too. Um, so this kind of a, you know, affects a lot of different places in houses. This is kind of a cutaway view of a house that shows you some of the more typical places, you know, where air is coming through. And we talked about the ABCs before. This is where it comes into play. The biggest leaks, the most important leaks, the ones that you really want to pay the most attention to are at the top of the house, the attic. If you don't have an attic, still the top of your house, right? So that would be TBC, top, bottom, center, but most people have attics. So the attic is the most important part. Uh, the other part of that equation is the basement. That's where most of the cold air is coming in. The center, believe it or not, is actually not where a lot of the air infiltration is happening, whether it's warm air leaving or cold air coming in. It's just in the middle. Um, and that's a little bit counterintuitive, right? Um, but important to think about in terms of building science. So how do you know what's leaking? 
Um, you know, if you want, you can go into your own attic. Uh, I would wear a dust mask for this, but you can go up there and look, and I would just look for stained fiberglass, right? Um, we we kind of call it uh, filter glass in the industry. It's kind of a joke, you know, they have filter glass in their attic because if you have it over like a white PVC vent pipe, like you see in their top left picture over a period of years, that pink fiberglass won't be pink anymore. It'll be completely covered and saturated with pollen and dust and things like that. It's usually not mold or anything. It's just particles that are in the air. So a little trickle of air has been coming out of that pipe for, you know, whatever, five, 10, 15 years. Um, it doesn't matter if you have pink bat fiberglass or if you have white blown uh, fiberglass, the bottom left picture shows a bathroom fan and you can see all that black around it. That's because the bathroom fan has all these little holes around it and there's a gap around it and air has been constantly leaking out of there. So that's what's making all that white fiberglass dark. Um, electricians, what's their job? Their job is to run wires. Their job is not to make a house airtight. <laughs> So when they run a wire like the one you see in that middle picture there or two wires in a hole, actually, this is kind of an interesting picture because usually there's a couple other holes that they tried to drill first and it wasn't in the right place. So then they usually there's two or three holes. Only one of them has a wire coming out of it, but they are leaking, which means any air getting into that wall cavity will be coming out of that hole. Because remember, there's also wires that go across your wall from electric socket to electric socket to electric socket. So air can go in around electric socket here and then go sideways and then go up and go out this hole that you're seeing in this picture here. And then that's why you see that stained fiberglass there. If you have a chimney going up to your house, that's a real big one here. Um, there's a huge gap around chimneys. This is actually, eh, I'd say a moderate one, three or four inches. But if you went up in your attic in the wintertime, you'd probably feel a whole bunch of hot air coming out of that gap. And that is expensive air. So you really don't want that to be happening. So you guys know enough about conduction and convection now to sort of probably answer this question. Do you think this uh, pegboard attic hatch is a good idea? This was actually a real picture. This person uh, had been living in this house for 10 years with this pegboard, you know, a pegboard. It's the stuff you have in your, in your clot, in your garage and you have hooks and you move your shovels and your rakes around. Like not a very good idea, right? It's letting all air through all those holes. Even if you put 15 inches of insulation uh, over those, holes it's still going to let air through so it's it's and it's only this thick wood is about r1 per inch it's only let's say this is a quarter inch thick let's say it's really thick it's a half inch it's still only r.5 and it should be r50 for this little bit here so really uh, a lot of things like this um, that you may find if you start poking around your house a little bit harder Another reason why you want to make sure that the uh, air in your house stays in your house is because if it gets up into your attic, it's not just an energy loss, but it's also more than likely going to cause a moisture issue. Uh, it might not be that moist in your house right now. Let's say you have 50% relative humidity in your house in the wintertime. That's comfortable. It doesn't feel too humid. But if that air actually gets into your attic and it cools off, it's going to go from 50% up to 60, 70, 80% humidity. And then you're going to get condensation or you're going to get frost. See the, the bottom left, uh, bottom right picture there. Um, now, I'm not a mold expert technically. So like if I went in this attic, I couldn't tell this customer that's definitely mold. I would, might say you might want to get, you know, uh, a mold company in here to look at that to see if it needs to be remediated or not. Um, but if I touch that stuff and it's I'm like, oh, that's frost. Like I don't have to get a license or take a class to know what frost is. Uh, and I'm in attic sometimes where the whole underside of the sheathing is covered with frost or or just you know water if it's not cold enough for that. So there's a lot of other uh, you know building durability issues and, and health and safety issues that come with this type of thing. Um, we talked about the attic going down in the basement. Obviously, if you can see light coming in around the door, well, first of all, you should make sure you have a door like this. Uh, I'm in homes sometimes they don't even have a door going to the bulkhead. Um, bulkhead doors are not designed to be airtight. They're only designed to be watertight. Um, so weather stripping on this door would be a great idea. Um, the, the rim joist, which is the area between the foundation and the first floor, there's a lot of places where air can sneak in there because it's the lowest point in the house. Um, and the wood twists and it shrinks over time and foundations settle. So there's a lot of big gaps usually in most people's houses there. And you don't want to just stuff in fiberglass like, like it's shown there in the middle with the big you know red X because that's not going to do anything. Um, bottom picture shows you why, because after a couple of years, that's kind of what it'll look like. You can see that picture, that piece of insulation that I pulled out of there, it actually has like a black rectangle 
right that matches the little cracks in the back exactly because that's where the air has been coming in from the outdoors you know even outdoor air has has dust and pollen in it again the center of the house is not the priority that's not really where the pressures and the pressure uh, temperature differences are the greatest but usually there's some things you can do there if you have a chimney you want to make sure you have a good uh, damper in there you can do something like a chimney balloon if you don't use your chimney very much um, Windows, a lot of people think they leak a lot. They usually don't leak as much as people think. Um, we got a slide coming up that talks a little bit more about windows. But again, I wouldn't even start to do anything in the center of your house until you've done stuff in the attic and you've done stuff in the basement. So usually at a certain point, someone's like, well, dude, don't houses have to breathe? I heard that houses have to breathe. Like we need to have fresh air. Well, yeah, it's true. Uh, well, it's partially, houses don't need to breathe. People do need to breathe and people need to breathe fresh air. Um, so you do have to have a certain, uh, you know, amount of fresh air in your house. Uh, it's really, really hard to get your house to the point where it's so tight that that's an issue. Um, unless if you're starting to build a house from scratch, maybe you can do it, but in a, an existing home, excuse me, it's really difficult to do. So the fact is most houses are way, way leakier than they should be. You could tighten them up considerably. You could save lots of energy and you're still going to be, uh, at the point where you still have plenty of you know, fresh air. We used to say, um, you know, they used to say houses need to breathe. Sort of the, the newer, newer way of looking at things is to seal tight and ventilate right. What that means is if you're building a new home, especially, you want to seal it as best as you possibly can. And then instead of just relying on cold air leaking in different places and then warm air leaking out in other places like willy nilly, uncontrollable, you actually put in some systems to actually get that mechanical ventilation. So you exhaust some stale air and you can bring in some fresh air from the outside. It's really not that hard to do. You can do it with what's called an HRV here. And you can even do it with just a simple bath fan. It has to be uh, a certain type of bath fan, um, but you can take care of these needs um, in other ways besides just you know relying on holes and gaps and things in your house. Need to put a, a slide in here about bath fans just because it, they're so poorly done in so many people's houses. Um, you should always have a bath fan in, in bathrooms that have like, you know, a, a shower or a tub. You don't really need it, especially like in a room, it's just a, a powder room like that. That's not really necessary, but um, any bathroom uh, with showers and tubs and it, it should go all the way to the outside, not just dumping near the soffit vent or near the gable vent, but it should go all the way to the outdoors. And you should never use this white junky stuff um, you can sort of see why in that one picture there, I, you know, that was cracked. That's a piece of ice in there in the wintertime because the condensation froze. Um, that stuff is terrible. Uh, so there's a lot of work that can be done, you know, for uh, energy savings and also for um, health issues regarding bath fans. Oh, and they should also be in, uh, done independently. So if you have three bath fans, you want them all going out independently, not hooked together. Uh, that's just a bad idea. Getting back to the idea of indoor air quality, you know, it's also really important to sort of take a step back and say, well, what are the sources of um, things that, are, that could be potentially bad for me in my house? Like, do I have a crawl space like this with, you know, possibly radon coming up out of the ground and moisture coming up out of the dirt? Um, am I storing gasoline in my basement or paint? Things like that. Um, is my dryer going outdoors or do I have that dumping into my basement? Cause I think it's helping me save energy. Like there's all sorts of things you can think about, um, you know, going back to the source and figuring out like, where are these potential problems of, you know, indoor air quality problems and indoor moisture problems. You know, you can't, we're not, we're never going to tell you to like, get rid of your pets, get rid of your plants. Don't cook anymore. Just do takeout. Like, I mean, that no one wants to live like that. You have things that are going to uh, impact you, but you just have to be thinking about these things. So now that we've talked about conduction and convection a little bit, you could probably take some guesses as to why this house has all these big ice dams. Hopefully this isn't anyone's house in here. I did have a picture in the slideshow a few years ago and of something else and I put it up there and there was a lady in the audience, that's my house. <laughs> so um, I think this house was actually taken, this is actually over in Vermont, I think, but now we never promise anybody that we can get rid of their ice dams, but in most cases, most houses that have heat in them, the, if the ice dams are there, that's because of heat loss, right? And that's something we're trying to combat here. So the two, two, two things could be going on here, one or the other, or both. Um, this, this attic could be fully insulated. 
it could meet the you know building code to R value of R50. And it still could look like this. And the way that could happen would be it's got tons of leaks and holes in the ceiling. So all the air in the house is getting up into the attic and just going right through the insulation and you know, sort of rendering it meaningless. Um, it also could be only R19 or R10 in the attic. Uh, and it could be perfectly sealed. And you still might have an ice dam situation like this because the heat, remember, is always going to be constantly going through the sheetrock, working its way through the insulation. Um, so it's probably a combination of both. You know, not enough insulation, not enough R value, a lot of conductive heat loss. And then there's also probably convective heat loss going up here. Um, there's also things like, um, you know, if you look carefully at this picture, it looks like there's two chimneys. One's got snow on it, one doesn't. So my guess would be one chimney might be kind of an old one that's not being used anymore. The other chimney might be a wood stove. So if you went in that attic and, and went over there and felt that brick chimney, it's probably pretty warm. So you got this big warm thing in your attic. So that's going to be contributing a little bit to the ice dam situation too. Um, and you can have an ice dam on a, on a shed in your backyard. You know, if you have a dark colored roof and it's facing the right direction and you get a lot of sun, snow on there and then you get three or four days of sunshine, you know, even the ultraviolet rays can start to melt snow on a roof. Um, and then it gets to the edge and it, um, you know, causes these problems. Um, yeah, these can be really dangerous too. I mean, they, I've seen them come off of roofs and crush cars. Um, and yeah, you don't want to be underneath that if that comes off. Um, really dangerous. Sometimes they look kind of pretty and think they're, people think they're quaint and everything, but uh, that's usually a sign that there's something going on in this house, uh, you know, big heat loss problem. And hopefully you know enough to know that this is not the solution for an ice dam, roof melt tablets. This was in a, a local hardware store a couple of years ago. I, I got a kick out of it because it's not safe and it's not easy. Um, now, I guess technically speaking, it's not false advertising because it is going to kind of get rid of the ice dam. I mean, I'm not going to lie, it is. But the problem is in two weeks after we get another snowstorm, you're going to have another ice dam because this is just like a one shot deal. Like you put it up there um, and whether you trudge up there with it on your back, get your ladder out and you put the sack on your back and go up and sprinkle it or you put it in socks and try to throw it up there. I mean, no matter how you do it, um, even if you do a great job, you're, it, it's only a one-time thing. So, you know, this is definitely not uh, something you want to be doing all the time. If you find yourself doing this, that means you have other issues going on. So again, going back to those ABCs, attic is the most important place to start. Um, you want to make sure your attic is fully insulated, but it's really important and more important to make sure that's air sealed first. Uh, here's a fellow here blowing cellulose into his attic. Great thing to do, but hopefully he went around and he found all the places where the electricians and the plumbers and everyone else cut all these holes and took care of all those problems first, because it's really hard to do after you put in all this insulation. So the order is important. So attic first, but make sure you do the air sealing first and then worry about the insulation. Uh, this is an interesting, um, on this right here, is a kind of a weird, weird hybrid approach. This, these people actually had insulation in their attic that was so far gone in terms of mice and things like that, that they wanted it all removed. And once it was all removed, it's kind of like a blank slate. It's like a new house. So they decided, um, I think this was actually plaster and lath too. So that was really, really leaky. So they decided the house come in and we actually put like a layer of, uh, just a thin two inch layer of spray foam over the whole entire attic floor. And that acts as the air barrier and it seals it up really well. And then we came in and put like a foot of cellulose uh, on top of that because that's much more cost effective to use. That's why you can see that little wood barrier there around the chimney because the uh, cellulose is going to be stacked up, you know, about a foot tall next to that. On the left is a picture of a, you know, a chimney chase that used to be that is no longer there because it's been sealed up. Now, this is kind of an, uh, you can't just like squirt some foam in there or something or stuff fiberglass down there. It's not going to work and it's not really safe either. You're not supposed to have something combustible up against there. So that white stuff is actually like sheet metal and the red stuff is fire caulk. So it's really important that if you're going to do this kind of stuff that you do it right. Uh, otherwise you could cause other problems in your house. These are some other pictures of, um, these are actually professionally installed um, projects, but I suppose if you're really handy and, and you, you could, you could make this happen for yourself too. Um, top left picture is, is a, an attic that needed to be insulated, but they also needed some storage, right? So we, we built a nice cover for the hatch and then we sort of split the attic in half and we, we made them a part that they could store some stuff. And then behind that, the wall is fully insulated. Um, top right is a drop down stair. You know, the first time I was there, when you pulled the drop down stair, you could look right up into the attic. 
that's not good. So this is a insulated, you know, cover. It's about six inches thick insulated that goes right over that drop down stair. Um, below that is another example that was kind of a really interesting one because not only you can see it's sort of like an L shape, they actually made sure that they got the left, the side of it too, because that part would be losing heat too. Um, sometimes we we'll use spray foam in attics and knee wall spaces. On the left, you can see where we uh, the knee wall space was was spray foamed. Again, there's all sorts of different um, you know methods and techniques for doing these things. Each house is a little bit different. Capes can be really uh, challenging. Um, a lot of times we would be using spray foam in there because a lot of capes were built and they only have, uh, you know, back in the 50s or 60s, 70s even, they were only using two by sixes. So you really only have five and a half inches. So you better use something that has a really good R value per inch in there because you only have five and a half inches to work with. Um, so that's where spray foam would come in. Uh, on the right is uh, what we call Thermax. It's a, it's a foil face board. And that is important because that's, that's uh, okay to be left exposed like for fire code reasons, as opposed to some of the other colors of board you might see like in a hardware store. You know, basements, this is a classic, you know, before and after picture, right? There you can see the bulkhead door. You can see the light coming in around there. Obviously that's a huge source of cold air coming in. So this was built, uh, you know, a plywood and plywood weather stripped, and rigid foam board door in there. Um, nothing fancy, nothing too pretty, but it works real well. In almost every case, you know, the walls are the place you really want to insulate in your basement, not the ceiling, right? Because chances are you probably have a boiler or a furnace, which means you have pipes and ductwork, and you might have a laundry machine down there and you got a water system, things like that. So you don't want all that stuff on the other side of your insulation. Um, so the way to get a good thermal barrier on the bottom of a house is almost always to take care of the walls. Uh, and it's not because you care about the stuff in the room. Like if you're storing stuff down there, the stuff doesn't care what the, what the temperature is. But when you're standing up there on the first floor, there's only a little bit of wood and then a little bit of concrete or, or bricks or rocks or whatever it is. Um, so if you have a rubble foundation, really spray foam is the only way to go with that because it's, it's so sort of convoluted and in the outie. Uh, if you have a really smooth concrete wall, then you could do something like a rigid foam board like you see there on the top left. Um, basement walls can be really tricky. You know, um, it's really easy to kind of do it wrong and cause more problems. So this is, you know, one of the areas where you might want to consider getting some, you know, professional help on this kind of thing. Again, the center of the house, there's not a whole lot you can do. This house happened to have a chimney that went through a knee wall space. So we did a lot of air sealing around the edge of that chimney. Um, again, there's some really good weather stripping out there, things like that. But again, I wouldn't focus on this because that is the lowest priority. If you have empty walls in your house, um, that's a great uh, place to put insulation. Um, the thing is you're only gonna be able to get, you know, three and a half or four or six inches of insulation in there because you're confined by the size of the cavity. Um, so it's a, it's a very uh, laborious too because you have to take siding off. Um, you have to drill holes. You have to use a special machine. It's not the same machine that you might get at Home Depot or Lowe's for blowing in the attic like that other gentleman was doing in the attic. Uh, this is called dense packing. It's a really sort of um, specialized technique. Um, very, very time consuming and, and um, definitely another area where you'd want to get some uh, professional help because it's really hard, even for professionals, it's really hard to do this really well. If you have a forced hot air system, then you got a lot of ducts that are probably running in new wall spaces or up in attics. Places like that, um, they're probably not sealed because they didn't have to be. So why, see, you, know, you know, back in the day, even as, as far as a year or two ago, people weren't doing this. Um, you can do it with foil tape. You don't want to do it with duct tape. I know that sounds crazy. It seems like duct tape would be for ducks, but it really is works really poorly there. Um, the best thing to use is mastic. It's like this goopy stuff that you put on with your, your fingers or a stick. Uh, that works really well. So hopefully there aren't any uh, you know, people who are close to the window sales industry or there aren't any window salesmen in the audience because uh, I'm probably gonna insult them right now, but I don't know what kind of math those people use because um, they're selling all these windows saying that they're saving a lot of energy and they really don't. Um, they're always gonna be the worst part of your house. Even the best window from Canada or Sweden or Germany, triple pane, argon, whatever, it's gonna be the worst part of your house. So to spend like $2,000 and only make 
what is it, three, like 10 square feet of your house only to, to get that to be a little bit better than it was before and then still have it be the worst part of your house for two grand. Like that's, I don't know what kind of math they can use to make that uh, work right. It, it just doesn't, it's not there. Um, now there are some things you can do with windows. Uh, if they're leaky, you can ask yourself, why is this cold air coming in around my window? And now you can say, well, I know why it's coming in because somewhere else in my house, there's warm air going out. And then you go and you, you tackle that issue. You, you take care of the warm air leaving your house. And then all of a sudden you, you might find that your old single pane windows aren't very leaky anymore, even though you didn't touch them. So that's the first thing you can do. Um, if you want to address the window itself, you can get interior storms made pretty cheaply these days. You can get cellular shades. You can get thermal curtains. There's all sorts of things you can do. And those are a fraction of the cost of a new window. Um, and they're going to do almost the same thing. So that's my spiel on, on windows. Um, very, very rarely is that going to be a cost effective measure. We're going to talk, you know, near the end of the presentation about the New Hampshire Saves rebate program. Guess what? They don't cover windows because windows aren't a cost effective measure. That's why they don't cover them. Um, so, yeah, so we're probably feeling overwhelmed because I've been going for a long time and a lot of information. So let's just talk about, you know, what does it look like to get, you know, get professional help? I mentioned that a few times. Well, getting an energy audit might be a really good idea for your house rather than just trying to like figure it out on your own and piecemeal it and, and then wonder. Um, and an energy audit is going to be like a comprehensive assessment of your whole entire house. It's not just going to be, you know, one attic. It's going to be every attic, every knee wall space, every crawl space, every basement. Look at how everything's working together. They're going to do combustion safety testing on all your heating equipment and your hot water equipment, things like that. And then you're going to get a written report at the end. It's going to tell you like, okay, here's what's going on. Here's the best way to do it. Here's how much it'll cost. Here's how much it'll save. Um, really, really good investment. Uh, I do audits for houses that are from 1700 and I'm doing one later this week. It's a brand new house. The lady just bought it and she's convinced that there's something wrong with it or shortcut was taken. And I got a feeling I'm probably going to find it because there probably was. Like I said, in New Hampshire, it's kind of the wild west. So you don't need to be, uh, there is no training or sort of uh, like licensing for energy auditors here. So you want to get someone who's, um, got some experience and got some training and got some certification. BPI happens to be one of the sort of bigger national organizations that trains auditors. There are some other ones. Um, they're all good, but just make sure you get somebody who is trained because again, anybody can say that they're an energy auditor. Um, they're gonna wanna know things about blower doors and infrared and things like that. Um, if you're looking for a list of qualified people, you can go to this organization called REPA. Uh, it's the Residential Energy Performance Association, and they have a whole list of um, qualified people who can do this for you. I believe their website is actually undergoing a revamping right now, and um, you might not be able to get on there right now, but soon you should be able to get on there and get some more information. You can also contact New Hampshire Saves, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Even if you don't get into the rebate program, they can actually forward you the names and contact info of some, some people that they use uh, in their program. So if you do get a blower door, it's gonna look like this. It's a big fan that goes in the doorway and it depressurizes the house. It sucks all the air out. You can still breathe though. You can still be there because air is gonna be coming in through all the gaps and the cracks and the holes. So you use this thing to sort of quantify the air leakage and figure out how bad is this problem. You use it to find out where the, where the, where the leaks are. Um, technically speaking, every new house is supposed to get one of these tests, believe it or not, in New Hampshire. Um, but I, can, I know it for a fact that not every town is making this happen. Um, there are certain towns, and it's kind of willy-nilly. Sometimes it's little tiny little towns out in the middle of nowhere, and it's also big towns like Portsmouth and Nashua that are enforcing this. But every new house is supposed to get a blower door test and pass a certain um, you know, building tightness uh, level. Really good, neat tool. The only time that you might not be able to get this done in your house is if you have um, vermiculite insulation in your attic because that could have some asbestos in it. If you have asbestos pipe wrap in your basement, like leftover or still associated with a steam heat system, uh, or like if you had a lot of mold or bats or something in your attic, uh, those are the reasons why you might not be able to get that. Um, but you can still get an energy audit done. You don't need to have this test done, but it is a really good test. The other interesting thing that you might see taken out of the tool bag if you get an audit is an infrared camera. Now an infrared camera, it's not like in the movies. It doesn't see through the walls and tell you like how many bad guys are in the next room. Is it two or is it four? Like. Um, all it does actually is tell you the surface temperature of whatever it is you're looking at. And then you have to kind of 
figure out what's going on there. So like when I was looking at this wall here with the home sign there, the H-O-M-E, like the H-O is a different color than the M-E. So that means there's something going on there because they shouldn't be different colors. They should be the same color, same temperature. You know, and it turns out there was a big issue with that wall. Um, bottom left picture was a uh, that triangular area that you can see there. It's, it's freezing cold. That's why it's so purple. And believe it or not, you know, guess are you as you would imagine that the bathroom right underneath there, they've had frozen pipe two years in a row because the space right above it is freezing cold. Uh, of course, this house was was designed by an architect. <laughs> Hopefully there's no architects. I don't piss them off either. But uh, I mean, there are some good architects out there and there's, there, there's some that are doing some really good work, but there's also some that seem to have sort of missed the class on, uh, you know, convection and conduction in houses and things like that. Um, anyway, infrared cameras can be really neat. Um, honestly, sometimes I use them in houses and they don't really show me a whole lot. Uh, they're interesting. And, and, and sometimes in other houses, it's just absolutely crucial. It, you know, it shows you things that you never would have figured out otherwise. As I mentioned, the other thing that you'll get in an audit is combustion safety testing of all your heating equipment, furnaces, boilers, hot water heaters, because those things um, are producing carbon monoxide and other things that can really hurt you and really kill you. Um, I didn't have time to look, but I guess, I'll bet you if you got on Google News right now and you typed in like carbon monoxide deaths into, into Google News, you'd get at least two or three headlines from the past week from somewhere, somewhere, somebody somewhere around the country that died from carbon monoxide. It could be, you know, Texas, it could be North Carolina, it could be Maine, it could be California. And usually it's because of some kind of malfunctioning water heater or furnace or boiler or something like that. Um, so a lot of things can go wrong with this stuff. So you want to make sure that stuff's running right. Um, they also will do this test at the end of a project. So if you do a project and you tighten up the house and you insulate it, you do all this stuff, you, know, you want to get this test done again to make sure that nothing's changed so that you're not getting something like, you know, backdrafting of carbon monoxide or something like that. Heating systems really should be checked out every single year, service tuned, um, filters replaced. You know, a lot of, I've been in homes where people are like, oh yeah, no one's touched that thing for 20 years. It still works great. I'm like, yeah, I don't think it's working great. Like <laughs> it, you can't just put it, turn it, you know, put it in and turn it on and leave it there for 20 years. You've got to have these things looked at and serviced. So I really recommend you do that. This is an interesting picture I took. Um, I was running a blower door test in uh, Portsmouth a few years ago. And uh, as I told you, the, the blower door test sucks in air through gaps and cracks and holes, right? So actually, it can actually open and shut doors sometimes. Anyway, I cranked it up. We heard a big bang upstairs. And the homeowner said, what was that big bang? And I said, oh, it's probably just your cat or something got scared. She said, no, I, I remember I don't have any pets. And I said, well, it's probably just a door. Anyway, long story short, went upstairs and looked around. All the doors were still open. But in her bathroom, this was her, her uh, mirror over her sink. It, I sucked it right off the wall. And it dropped into her sink. It didn't break or anything. Not that I'm superstitious, but behind it was a big hole. And that went right into a big attic. You know, and that's where she said, well, this was a flipped house and it was built in the 50s. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, there was probably like a really ugly medicine cabinet there. And the house flipper just like chucked it in the dumpster and was like, oh, what's the cheapest thing to do? Um, you know, just go to the Home Depot, get a little mirror. We'll just put a nail in and put a mirror over it, you know. So all the air in her house all the warm air was going out around that mirror and then out into that attic. And she had a really bad ice dam situation over there and her bills were sky high because she was essentially heating up, you know, an uninsulated attic. If you have an old house and you're thinking, geez, man, I really am going to have a lot of stuff to do in my house. You know, it could be worse. You could have lit, you could live in this house. And most people think I'm crazy when I say that, but this house actually is one of the worst houses I've ever been in from a, energy point. It was also the biggest house I think I've ever been in almost, and also the most expensive, um, very beautiful house. That's Lake Winnipesaukee in the background there. Uh, I mean, this house was in the rebate program. So that means their, their fuel usage had to be really bad. And I'm thinking maybe I got the wrong address, you know, but I knocked on the door. They said, no, come on in. Uh, this is the right house. Um, huge, massive ice dams. They had ice dams so bad that the the water was starting to back up under the shingles behind the ice dam. It was coming into their house and they had like buckets on the ground and stuff to catch all the water coming into this big, beautiful house. So I'm looking around and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's, what's weird about that house. And I found something really, really obvious and, and easy. Um, and it was one of those learning experiences where you just, you, you, you never know which houses are going to be, um, you know, need a lot of work and which ones don't. So there's a lot of programs through New Hampshire Saves. There's lights, 
there's LED lights, there's appliance rebates. I mentioned all those. There's uh, even if you're building a new house, there's rebates for that kind of stuff. Um, but what we're, what we're really here to talk about is for people who have a home now and they want to get an audit done and they want to get work done in that home, a retrofit project. So I'm going to move through these and then come back to that just for time. Um, so this is how you uh, get into this New Hampshire Saves Rebate Program. You go to their website and you have to know a couple of things. You put a couple of things in, in their calculator. And if you get in, you get a hundred dollar energy audit, which is a really good deal to start with. Um, and then they'll actually pay for 75% of the improvements up to $6,000. Um, now the catch is that the improvements that the auditor finds and puts into the computer software, they have to meet what's called a benefit cost ratio, which basically means, you know, how much does it cost the utility and how much energy does it save? And if it's, good enough, then they'll pay for it. 90% of the time, it's not a problem, especially if you're using propane or oil, it's usually not an issue. Everything that the auditor finds, the utility is like, yeah, yeah, we'll pay for that, we'll pay for that, we'll pay for that. Um, sometimes if you have natural gas and some other things like that, sometimes it can be a little tricky to get those um, improvements to, to meet the muster there, but um, still a really, really good program. They also have some financing too that goes with this stuff too. So not only would they pay 75% of it, but in some cases they'll pay a significant part or all of your part of it too. And then they just tack it on your electric bill. Uh, I know Eversource is doing it for at 0%. So they're basically forwarding you the money to do uh, this project. And then you get, you know, just tacking on your electric bill. And usually the savings over the year are greater than the increase in your, in your bill. So great program. So you go to this website, you go to test your home and then you click on the button and you got to know a few things. You got to know how big your house is. Um, that's important that it's the heated space, not the, not what your tax card says the living space is. Sometimes those things are not the same. There are some towns that would call like an unheated sunroom on the back of your house, a living space, but that's not heated space. That's living space. So make sure you're only using heated space in here. Uh, you put in your zip code, you put in your, your electric your utility, and then you put in how much you use for heat. It could be gallons of oil. It could be a quart of wood and, um, therms of, of uh, natural gas. It could be pellets and it could be electric combined. You can put in two, two types of heat into here. Uh, if you have more than two, you can actually still get into the program. You just got to call them out. You just have to call them and they will figure out how to take your third or fourth heat source and turn it into a fuel type of the other one. For instance, if you had oil, electric and wood, you can't put all those in. You can only put two. So they, you would put in like the electric or maybe you would put in the, the uh, oil and the wood, and then they would look at your electric bill and they would put in the electric on their own. And then you see if you get in, you hit the go button and you actually is a little speedometer like this. You have to get, well, in the past, you had to get an eight. If you were in it, got an eight, you were in the program. Things have gotten a little bit tighter now. Now you have to get a nine if you're Eversource or the co-op. And you have to get a 10 if you have Liberty or Unitil as your gas or your electric. So the, the threshold there has changed a little bit. It's gotten a little harder and it kind of varies from utility to utility, which I'm not very happy about. You know, it's called New Hampshire Saves. I think it should be the same for everybody. Uh, and I've made my, that opinion known, um, but for it is what it is for now. Um, I don't know if we have anybody here from New Hampton, Ashland, Wolfboro, or Littleton, but if you are, Sorry, you're out of luck. Um, you guys have your own little municipal electric companies. Um, so you can't really get into this program. Um, you're, you, you don't have Eversource. You have to have Eversource, the co-op, Liberty, or Unitil, which are the, you know, the four suppliers for the rest of New Hampshire besides those four towns. So you plug your numbers in. You keep your fingers crossed. You hope you get up to the level that you get in. And then they let you in the program. An auditor comes out, does an audit, gives you a proposal. Um, it might look something like this. This is a, a one we did recently. Um, you know, on the left is all the proposed, it's obviously longer than this. This is just the contract part, right? So the left is the improvements. It tells you the cost. It tells you how much the rebate would be, how much your part would be, payback, et cetera, et cetera. The, the numbers I want to bring your attention to are at the bottom where it says totals, right? So this project was a total of $10,000. Pretty big project. Uh, the rebate was going to be six thousand dollars, so Eversource was going to pay six grand to that, which only only left four for the homeowner. Now, this person actually did the whole project. If you decided, oh, well, four is, even four is too much for me, 
the auditor can go back in and say, okay, well, let's see what would happen if we just did the attic and not the basement or vice versa. Um, we can change things. It doesn't have, it's not a take it all or leave it kind of thing. So this project had um, increasing the attic floor ventilation uh, insulation. We were reducing the air leakage by a couple hundred. We were improving the rim joist insulation in the basement. We were in also improving the basement wall insulation, it looks like. So we were kind of doing a lot of different things, um, but it doesn't have to be all those things. That's my point. Um, by the way, if, you are a, uh, uh, if you're a renter, you can still get in this program. Um, you'd obviously have to work with your landlord, um, but it, it doesn't really matter if you own your house or you rent your house, we can, we can still do it. If you're a landlord, on the other hand, let's say you're a landlord and you have a, a, a pretty big house. We're doing one right now in Exeter <laughs> that has five apartments in it. The owner lives in one and he rents out the other four. Well, guess what? They all have their own electric meters. And guess what that means? They, he gets five rebates. <laughs> Because it's not done by the address, it's done by the electric meter. So he got five rebates from the electric company. So he's getting like, I don't know, something like $20,000 from the electric company to get all this work done in his house. And it's only going to cost him like three or four, I think, at the most. Um, really, really good program. There also are programs for people who are income um, dependent. Um, you know, in this, in this, the program I just told you about, they don't care how much money you make. That, that, you know, $3 million house I showed you in uh, on Lakewood Upsaki was getting a rebate. Um, but it has to do with the energy use. But there is a program, too, for income eligible people. Um, there's a really long waiting list, I think, in most uh, in most um, cities or in most counties for that, unfortunately, which is really sad to see. Um, we're hoping that with the IRA money coming in, uh, that hopefully those programs will expand and that 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 waiting list will go down. Uh, right now, I think there's a pretty significant waiting list for that. Um, what else? Uh, I wanted to go backwards a little bit and show you some of these other rebates. If you're thinking about getting, um, you know, if your heating system is getting near the end of its useful life or you're worried it's going to, um, you know, die in the middle of the winter time or something, that's the time to look for, you know, a more efficient way of, of creating heat in your house. There's a lot of different... Uh, Rebates now for higher uh, efficiency systems, uh, especially uh, cold climate heat pumps or mini split systems, you may have heard them call. Um, those are really um, becoming more and more popular. Um, I was at a workshop the other day and the main rep for one of the major manufacturers has just moved over to New Hampshire because he's actually said he's kind of bored in Maine. They are giving out so many rebates and people are putting in, re in heat pumps so quickly in Maine that um, he, he wants to make inroads in New Hampshire because New Hampshire is very, very behind. Um, so heat pumps are, I have a slide coming up in a second about those. But again, you really want to be focusing on your, your, your building envelope or your thermal boundary, your air boundary first. You know, any good HVAC person will tell you that. Um, same thing with solar, right? Any good solar installer will, if they go in your attic to give you an estimate for a solar system to see like, is, is your roof strong enough to hold the solar panels? You know, like if they don't see any insulation, they should be recommending an energy audit first because um, that's going to be a, a, a much a more cost-effective measure uh, than what they're offering. Um, again, nothing against solar. Solar is great, but that's not the place to start. Um, yeah, I, I kind of liked one of my colleagues put this picture in down here of you know the, the the bucket with the with the holes in it. Like you know, you pour water in and it keeps leaking out. That's kind of like what you're doing if you're trying to. Um, if you get a, a, a new expensive high efficiency heating system, but your house is still leaking all the heat, it's like you're really not getting all the benefit from it. So really important that you kind of do things in the right order. Again, I mentioned heat pumps. Um, these are run on electricity. Um, they, I think, are going to be pretty much standard in every house. Like by the time my kids are buying houses, um, I think the idea of like a, a boiler or a furnace in the basement will almost be like antiquated. Um, there's an external unit that would either sit on the ground or be attached to your house. And then it would run through a, what's called a line set, which is only about as big as my forearm. And it would go to some of your different rooms. Um, the, re the really interesting thing about these things is they're not actually making any heat at all. And that's how they, that's the secret. That's how they get their efficiency because, you know, a propane boiler or a furnace is literally making heat. Like you're burning something, <laughs> whether it's a piece of wood or, or a drop of propane or oil, like you're burning something and making heat. So you can only be so efficient with that. There's always a lot of inefficiencies there, but a heat pump actually is taking heat from the outdoors, even when it's zero degrees outside, 
from a physics point of view, there's actually some energy out there that you can you can move into your house, not by opening up your window, but by using one of these systems because they have a compressor and a refrigerant and a really, really high, highly uh, sophisticated computer system in there. Um, and it'll, it'll ask itself, what is the bare minimum that I need to turn on to move some heat from the outdoors to the indoors and make this person 66 degrees or 68 degrees or 70 degrees, right? So they're very, very, very smart. As opposed to your boiler, your furnace, which it's kind of stupid. All it knows how to do is be on or off. Like if you come home and it's 66 degrees in your house and you want it to be 68, you turn on the boiler or the furnace, it's going to kick on at full speed to get you there only two degrees. If you come home at night at 60 and you want to get to 68 and turn it on, it's going to do the same thing. It's just going to turn on at 100%. Um, and, and really, uh, oftentimes, boilers and furnaces don't need to be on at 100%. They could be on a lot less than that, but they don't know how to do that. So that's part of the reason why these heat pumps are so efficient is they, they're almost never at zero or 100%. They're almost always um, like in between somewhere. In the same way you drive your car, right? You almost never stamp your foot on the, put your foot, you know, pedal to the metal and you almost never take your foot off and just coast. You're almost always somewhere in the middle. You have your gas on a little bit, just enough to get you the speed you want. And that's what heat pumps do too. Um, they're actually more than 100% efficient, which sounds like it violates the laws of physics. Like how could you, how could you use one kilowatt of electricity and make two kilowatts worth of heat? That doesn't seem like it's possible. But again, because of the refrigerant cycle and the compressors and the the, the computer technology that's in there, they actually are able to do that. Um, they actually are able to work in the, in the coldest times of the year too. Um, a lot of people think that they won't work in New Hampshire. They do. They actually just did a study after that big freeze we had uh, in Maine, because we really haven't had a really long extended um, freeze like that for a while. All these heat pumps, I think 1500 got put in in the last year or two in Maine and they contacted every single person and said how to go during that you know negative 20 and they all said that it did fine so there really were no issues with these heat pumps um the rebates for these things are a little bit different than like the insulation rebate it's done by the ton so it depends on like how big a system you get so obviously that the bigger the system the more rebate you're going to get um yeah and there are some other rebates for um you know, things like going to a natural gas boiler or furnace, let's say you have oil right now, but if you have that, that, that capability of getting natural gas, there are some things you can do with that too. Again, you go to New Hampshire Shade's website and uh, it takes a little bit of time, honestly, to get through there, but it, they're doing a better job these days of making it a little bit easier for people who find what they need there. It'll say like, you know, are you a business owner or are you a homeowner? Are you looking for insulation or are you looking for you know, a new furnace or a boiler, or you're looking for a heat pump, and it'll kind of lead you down in the right direction. Um, I also should point out, I hate to sort of toot someone else's horn, but Efficiency Maine is also a really good resource. If you're looking to learn more about this stuff, um, obviously, if you live in New Hampshire, the only rebate available to you is from New Hampshire saves. If you live in Maine, they have the equivalent, similar thing called Efficiency Maine, but uh, I'm really impressed by their website. Um, they have a whole bunch of resources on their website. Um, just on heat pumps alone, there's like eight different buttons you can press. Like how do heat pumps work? What's the advantages? What's the disadvantages? This kind of thing. Um, a lot of educational things on there. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you know, go to that Efficiency Main website and you should be able to find that stuff. Let's see, we went through all this stuff and we ended here. Um, IRA stuff is a little bit new, obviously. It's still being hammered out. Um, there are some really good rebates coming down the pike. Um, it has to be kind of planned out by the states, unfortunately. So I'm not really kind of holding my breath for the Department of Energy in New Hampshire to really quickly get this thing rolled out. But there is going to be a bunch of money coming for a lot of things, um, you know, have to do with electrification and, and uh, energy efficiency, that kind of thing. Um, but again, there's a little bit of a, question there about how it's going to work. Um, there also are some tax uh, incentives for a lot of this work too. And that stuff is um, you know not dependent upon the states. That's a, a national thing. So there are uh, you know tax um, credits or deductions that you can take for say insulating your home and getting an energy audit, that kind of thing. Uh, there are certain limits. I think it's 1200 bucks or maybe 1400. Uh, it might say here, I can't remember. I did some research. I actually got this off of um, 
Senator Shaheen's website. I'm not promoting her or anything like that. I'm just saying that's um, somebody told me she's got a good website with information on it. And that's where I got it from. Yeah. So it says twelve hundred dollars. Um, except for heat pumps and you can get up to $2,000 for a heat pump. So again, yeah, heat pumps are a little bit uh, expensive sometimes. Um, but when you factor in the fact that they're going to work for a long time, and if you're going to be in your home for a while, um, they also, the other benefit about using an electric heat pump is that if you ever got into solar electricity on your roof or in your backyard as a ground mount system, then you can disregard the, the energy spikes that the uh, utilities are putting out there in terms of electric rates, because you've essentially established your own electric rate for yourself for the next 20 years, you know, not just for your, your lights and your, your plug loads, but also for your heating system. If you actually have a heat pump that works on electricity. So I think we uh, covered all that. We did the basics in the beginning. We went over the ABCs. We talked about adding insulation wherever you can talked a little bit about getting some help from experts, um, how to do that, what you might expect. And then, a little bit about the New Hampshire Shades programs and all those different offerings. So at this point, I'm going to um, give you my email there. If you have any questions, you feel free to contact me. And uh, we all I just open I just it put up on a, to anybody else chat, who wants questions. Uh, in the chat, I put in um, a question. Okay. When you, when you have a, I have a, an older home that was done over, and it has a um, crawl space, a dirt floor crawl space. Right. And. Um, and my floors in my living room and stuff are freezing. Yeah. What can I do to warm up my floors? Well, and... you, you, it's obviously I'd have to, yeah, someone would have to take a look at it, but I mean, you could put insulation under the floor that would help your floors get a little bit warmer. But if you got a little, whole bunch of pipes or ductwork underneath that insulation below it, you're really not going to save a whole, whole lot on your energy bills because a lot of that heat is going to be, um, getting dissipated into your crawl space, which is not insulated. Like you wouldn't want a bedroom that's not insulated in the same way you don't want, um, you know, your basement or crawl space usually not to be insulated. So probably spray foaming the walls in there will probably be the best thing. Uh, if it's a dirt floor, you'd want to put poly down over that too, to keep the moisture down. Um, I was telling Emily, I, I looked at a house yesterday. Uh, she said she went to UNH. I did an audit yesterday for two girls that are students at UNH and they were living in this let's say it's a low rent place in, in Summersworth, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they didn't, they had no idea about the basement where it was or anything. I went outside and looked, there was a bulkhead door. So I opened it up and I went down there and there was like two feet of water <laughs> in the crawl space. Oh, I couldn't even go in there. It was so deep. Um, yeah. Crawl spaces are notorious for having issues and problems, yeah. but. Um, I was told not to put the pink insulation there because it will just get damp. Yeah. You know, and, and yep. rotten. It'll attract mice. Mice will have the yeah. beautiful time making nests up there. That's a terrible way of doing it. Yeah. Either on the walls or on the ceiling. Either way, that's usually, that's yeah. the kind of stuff that we're usually actually removing, you know, and right. then, um, and then insulating the walls. And unfortunately with a crawl space like that, uh, is it a boulder crawl space or is it like concrete block? Um, combination, I think. Yeah. If, it, if it's a smooth concrete wall, then you could in theory put some rigid foam board against it. You have to make sure it's, um, really well sealed against that concrete wall though because yeah. if you just mm -hmm. kind of put it up there loosely um, air will get behind it and then you can have condensation issues and things like that so you know unfortunately that's probably an area where you'd want to get somebody to look at it and, and look at doing some spray foam on there yeah okay well thank you very much you can actually get like um, home depot sells home like spray foam things you can do it yourself i, I don't really recommend it it's really messy it ends yeah. up being pretty expensive. I'm not going under there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, most people don't want to do that. But even yeah, if you did, to. you don't get that much out of each one. There's always waste yeah. at the end because one tank, it's two, it's two tanks and one like gets mm -hmm. used up quicker than the other. And then you got a disposal issue at the end. Yeah. Um, it's usually cheaper just to get a company that does it, you know, from a truck and they can get in there and do it right. And Yeah. And then you said put plastic. It was a plastic you said. Yeah, if it's a dirt floor, floor, typically that's the way to do it would be to put plastic down and then oh. that'll help keep the moisture out of there. Yeah. Okay. Is okay. there a sump pump down there or anything like that? Or no. 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 Does it stay pretty dry or is it moist or how would you characterize it? I would characterize it's pretty dry. Yeah. 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 There's plastic going around the edge of the the house. Yeah. You know, like a wind barrier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and 
that's all it's that it was done when an energy audit was done years really? and years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're definitely doing a lot more things these days than we did back then. Yeah. I'm gonna look at the chat here and see. Oh, ideal time. That's a good question. Um we do energy audits all year round. Um, you can even do infrared imaging all year round. You really only need a, a couple of degrees difference between the indoors and outdoors for an infrared camera to work right. Uh -huh. Usually I show people like when I come into their house, I can put my hand on their wall for like three seconds and then take it away and look at it with the infrared camera. And you can see some heat on the wall left from someone's hand. And it's, it's that sensitive. So um, we can do these all year round. Some days you get a cut. You have a couple of days in the spring and the fall where it's like, 70 degrees outside and 68 inside the house and sometimes it can be really difficult but you know most mornings even in the summertime most mornings it's pretty chilly outside and the house is a little bit warmer than that so you can still get a good infrared image um blower door that you that doesn't care what time of year it is you can do those all year round um so yeah audits can be done all year round um someone asked about electric homes do they get in yes they they definitely get in you're, you're eligible. Um, the hard thing is that when you look, when you look at your electric bill, you can't really tell like how much of that electricity went for your lights and your dishwasher and how much went for your heat. So what you would do is you would call up your utility and they would um, assess your bill and they would actually look at the big bump in the winter and they can actually pull out and say, okay, well, this is how much we think, you know, it's being used for heat and the rest of it is being used for everything else. So um, electric can be a little bit more difficult, but you definitely can still, um, you know, try to get in this program. And a lot of times people with electric heat, in my experience, they usually almost always end up getting in. Um, uh, someone had added here, you know, putting a timer on your water heater. That's a good idea. You know, um, you can also, we didn't talk about this, but uh, on-demand water heaters, um, you know, the idea of keeping 50 or 60 gallons of water hot in your basement 24 hours a day, just so that you can come home from work and take a shower for a few minutes and then like maybe do the dishes. And then in the morning, you have like, I think that's going to kind of go away too. Eventually that'll be as silly as leaving your car running while you go to the supermarket. So it's warmed up when you come outside, like just, nobody does that. It's not, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so an on-demand water system, um, like an on-demand, uh, usually they're gas propane or natural gas, um, or also they're all, they're also our heat pump water heaters now. Um, so those are also some really good options for, you know, for, for hot water. Uh, let's see, I see your question about the crawl space. Yes, uh, I see a question here about the heat pumps. Yeah, one thing I would caution you on with heat pumps is you have to adjust your way of thinking about heat pump, about heat. Um, typically, boilers and furnaces, because they're stupid and they can only be on and off, and because they operate on a really high temperature, like they produce some really, really hot water or some really, really hot air. And then they try to get it to the rooms as quick as they can and then push it into the room and hope that it heats up the room really quickly. Heat pumps don't, don't, don't think like that at all. Heat pumps actually work better if you keep them just on a set temperature all the time, in part because they don't actually make super, super hot air. They actually blow out air that's sort of, you know, like lukewarm or, or and it, it, maybe that doesn't sound good, but if your system is running all the time, and it's only putting out as much warm air as it needs to. That's actually much more efficient than cranking it up and making really hot air and then blowing it into the room and then sitting back and then waiting and then cranking it up again later. So yeah, heat pumps are a little bit of a different animal. Um, usually most heat pump installers that I'm familiar with are pretty good about educating their customers about how to run heat pumps, that you don't really run them the same way uh, as a traditional uh, you know, boiler or heater. Uh, then again, I've had people who have had, you know, I had a lady last year who had heat pumps put in for air conditioning. A lot of people are doing it for air conditioning more than anything else. Um, because again, because window air conditioners are really, really inefficient. So if you have three or four of those things running, a heat pump can do the same thing much, much more efficiently. But the added benefit is you can use it in the winter. So I asked this lady, I said, are you using it in the winter? She said, no, am I supposed to? I'm like, yeah, they didn't tell you that. <laughs> like, you're only using it for air conditioning. You're not getting the full, it's way more efficient than that big beast you have in your basement. It's only like 80% efficient. This, your heat pumps are twice, at least twice as efficient as that. Um, so if somebody put a heat pump in and just, you know, didn't tell her, tell her how to use it. Um, I also had a customer actually just yesterday, he had heat pumps put in recently and he was telling me that, uh, 
when they went to sort of put the heat pumps in, they were like, well, where do you want them? And the guy was like, wait, you're the expert. You tell me where they should go. How am I supposed to know where to put them? Um, so there is a pretty wide variety, I think, of uh, qualifications and experience levels out there with heat pumps. There's also a really wide variety of um, prices for heat pumps. Um, one thing I forgot to mention in that New Hampshire Saves program is all the insulation and stuff that you might get put in your house, no matter what contractor is there, uh, it's all the same price for everybody. It's all standard pricing. Um, but with heat pumps in the HVAC industry, just like the roofing industry or the siding industry or the window industry, they can charge whatever the heck they want. Um, and then it's up to you to kind of get the rebate uh, after the fact. Um, so it, for you know, a short example, I did an audit for a, a gentleman in Conway, New Hampshire, uh, earlier this winter, a big open concept house, like a ski chalet near the ski resorts. And it had been in his family for years. Uh, he had been using it on weekends just for skiing, electric heat throughout. So he does, he wants to move there with his wife and retire, but he doesn't want to be on electric heat, obviously. Uh, anyway, he was in the program. I went to his attic. I said, yeah, there's tons of stuff we can do for you in the attic. Um, Eversource is going to pay for most of it, et cetera, et cetera. I said, but have you ever heard of a heat pump? Your place would be a great place for a heat pump. He said, oh, those are too expensive. Uh, oh, so you've got a quote already. He said, yeah, I got a quote. How much? $40,000. And I said, what, what was he going to do? Like use gold or something? That's crazy. Um, he told me that he spends 90% of his time in this one big great room, which is like, you know, typical open concept house. It's like a living room, dining room, entry, and a kitchen all in one. And then they go to bed and then they come back out. All the other rooms in the house, they only use them when they have guests over or when the kids come to visit. Um, so a heat pump there for that big room and the, and, would probably be, I'm just guessing, six, seven, eight thousand dollars before a rebate. Um, the other rooms, you know, it would she should just stick with the electric heat for those rooms and turn it up when the when the guests come. But you know, it doesn't make sense to put a heat pump into every single room in that situation. And I think what happened was honestly, I think the HVAC person pulled in the driveway, and when he looked up, he probably saw what I saw, which was like a ninety thousand dollar car with Massachusetts license plates. And the HVAC guy was like, oh, wow, I'm going to really pitch this guy. I'm going to get a lot of money from this guy, you know. So he pitched him this really, really asinine proposal that had no, uh, you know, business being installed in that house. There's no way that he needed that many. He was, they were going to do like an external head over here, going to these three rooms, another one over here. I mean, way overcomplicated, way more expensive than it needed to be. You know, I said, you really owe it to yourself to, you know, call another HVAC contractor get them out of over here and tell them that, you know, you spend all your time in this one room and maybe a little bit in your bedroom and that's it. And, you know, they're going to give you a completely different estimate. So, you know, be a little bit careful about that. Ted, I think um, in the interest of time, we have time for one more question. Um, I see that okay. Katie has her hand raised. Katie, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, so Ted, I want to get your opinion on something. So sure. maybe we were two early adapters to a heat uh -huh. pump because we got our heat pump maybe about five or six years ago. Huh? And at that time, what they installed for us was a heat pump we use most of the time, but we also have a new furnace at the same time where when the weather gets cold enough that it's like, we can, I guess we can adjust the setting, but yeah. like say 32 or something, it kicks over to the furnace. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like a dual system. So um so I guess I'm a little frustrated to hear that there's now these cold climate heat pumps that can handle cold weather better, including this last cold snap we had. Does it make yeah. sense at some point to convert to one of those? Or, you know, I mean, it wasn't cheap, but I'll be is honest. It, but, is uh, yours, um, is it, so yours is a ducted system. It's not a ductless then? Um, yes, I think it is a ducted system. Yeah, I've if never, you have a furnace, it sounds like it's a duct. Like yeah. Most of the cold climate heat pumps are, are ductless, so they're not, it doesn't matter whether you have ducts or pipes or whatever, like they don't need that. They just go through the walls and they have a little thing either up on a ceiling or on the wall that, that produces the heat. It can definitely be a little more challenging when you get into the ducted systems. And yeah, honestly, like in the last five or six years, the technology has, has gotten a lot better. So I'd be willing to bet that you know, if you're going to get a new system put in today, it might be quite a bit um, more efficient than what you had. It's also, there's also a chance that it might not just be adjusted right. Um, 
they don't really tell tell people this enough, but you know, heat even a brand new heat pump this year, it should be serviced and cleaned every year. Uh, and there's a special way to do that. Um, a lot of it a homeowner can do themselves. But a lot of times people put, again, same thing with furnaces and boilers, they put these in and they just like leave them and think that they're going to work forever without any maintenance because they're still working and they're not making noise. So, you know, so it might be worth having somebody come in and take a look at that thing and just, you know, do a tune up and service it. And, oh, yeah. Um, no, we have it serviced every year. It just it's just I just making the contrast more of having a yeah. standalone heat pump doing everything for heating and cooling. You know, we made the switch actually because we our AC broke, and then we decided to yeah. upgrade the system. But it's a combo furnace for when the temperature really drops, plus a heat pump for right cooling, and it heats until it gets to like thirty degrees. Um, yeah. So it just seemed like that was the, what was offered at the time, not one of these cold climate. Um, sure. Yeah, and, and to be honest, it's, it's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse because we don't install heat pumps or anything. But I'm I'm wondering if there's a chance that yours can be like tweaked or or renovated or retrofitted to be a little bit more efficient. I, I don't honestly don't know if that's even possible. You might be just sort of stuck with what you have. Yeah, um, yeah. I can well, ask that question. So th yeah. thank you. Yeah. Well, Ted, thank you. For your time. Thank you so much for such an interesting presentation and all this really, really helpful information. We really appreciate all of your time. Um, well, you're welcome. Else, I will be following up tomorrow with the recording link in um, Ted's slides, and I can also send you this information on his email if you have any follow-up questions. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great night.